a strike like no other, the debate that tore apart the coal fields and the diplomacy that pieced it back together. It is hard to imagine that this peaceful scene was the setting for an 11 month labor strike involving one of the nation's largest coal producing companies, the Pittston Coal Company, against the United Mine Workers of America, generational miners, and their families. This labor struggle would be called a strike like no other. This strike drew the support of all union miners from states east of the Mississippi, as well as American labor leaders, foreign trade unions and their leaders, civil rights activists, replacement workers, hundreds of state policemen, federal marshals, a professional security detachment, and the media. The debate became so intense that it required the diplomacy of the United States Department of Labor to resolve. The debate was complicated by establishing the meaning of the strike itself. A corporation struggling to remain competitive, provide jobs, and yield a return to stockholders, or a working man's struggle to provide for his family, and a company's responsibility to honor pledges of health care for retirees and their dependents. Union officials also saw the strike as an even larger debate over the future of labor in America. Every issue in this strike involved debate. Was it a union whose objective was to break the company, or a company whose objective was to break the union? The 1989 strike began in 1987, when Pittston ended its membership in the Bituminous Coal Operators Association. The BCOA and union successfully reached a contract in 1988, but when the Pittston UMWA contract expired later that same year, no separate agreement could be reached. Nonetheless, in Pittston Mines, the slogan for union miners and company foremen was, Whatever it takes in 88. They did everything to keep mining coal after the contract had expired in preparation for a strike like no other strike. The debate ended in failure. April 5, 1989, the UMWA President Richard Trumka called for a selective strike at Pittston. After 14 months of debate, efforts to reach a contract failed. The mine workers refused to accept Pittston's demand to mine coal seven days a week to subcontract labor and to accept what amounted to a 20% cut in health care for retired miners and their dependents. Unlike many strikes, this strike was not over wages or working conditions. Miners held out for retiree and dependent health care. UMWA membership had stood 500,000 strong in 1950, but by 1989 it numbered 65,000. But Pittston's revoking retiree and dependent health cards energized the miners and won the many supporters and took the strike beyond the picket line into the communities. Pittston hired replacement workers. While the unemployment rate in Southwest Virginia exceeded 20%, most replacement workers, called scabs by the strikers, were brought in from outside the area. The United States Department of Labor ruled an unfair labor practice in July and barred Pittston from replacing striking union workers with permanent replacement workers. The union charged Pittston with violating American labor laws by discriminating against union workers and discouraging employees from joining the UMWA. The miners' tactic was to keep Pittston coal from reaching the market. They did this with picketing, mass sit-ins, and rolling roadblocks. Replacement coal haulers traveled in caravans with a Virginia State Police car in the lead and end. Strikers and their supporters crawled over the mountain roads, impeding the company's efforts to move coal. Strikers used jack rocks to puncture tires and keep Pittston from hauling coal in hopes of getting a contract sooner. The strike cut Pittston's coal production by 90%. Virginia is a right-to-work state, and Democratic Governor Gerald Belisles ordered 400 state policemen to the coal fields to ensure Pittston's right to mine coal. At any time, up to 400 Virginia state policemen were assigned to the coal fields to keep the peace and to investigate what they call criminal and mischievous behavior. State police records show $7.7 .7 million were spent during the nine months of the strike. 140 striking miners and their supporters were arrested for blocking coal trucks from entering or exiting the Moss 3 preparation plant. Governor Belisles was successful in getting Pittston and UMWA to agree to federal mediation. 
As court and post bonds mounted, Roberts believed the mine workers' struggle would be vindicated before the U.S. Supreme Court if necessary. He said the UMWA Pittston contract fight was establishing a precedent over all companies being responsible for their retiree and beneficiary health care. The union was fined for exceeding the number of pickets at any one site. Federal Judge Glenn Williams weighed in to find the miners for ignoring the lower court's orders. In all, $64 million were levied against the union. Judge Williams called in U.S. Marshals, who maintained a 24-7 presence, yet they only arrested five people. The theme for the strike was solidarity, and to the striking miners, camouflage symbolized solidarity. To others, it gave the strikers anonymity and allowed them to blend into the surrounding countryside. While democratic movements throughout the world drew the support of the American people and political leaders, the attention from the labor conflict that would be called a strike like no other strike drew relatively scant and short notice. Perhaps the efforts to protect the rights of labor were not seen as democratic in America, as in Poland or China or Germany. This debate spilled over into the communities that depended on incomes from union mining jobs capable of supporting middle class families, union jobs that had helped create the middle class. Secretary of Labor Elizabeth Dole came to the coal fields. Ms. Dole was overwhelmed by the realization that this strike had divided the community and families. The labor conflict drew over 50,000 supporters to Southwest Virginia. These were mostly blue-collar workers from around the nation who came to support the right to collective bargaining and union representation. Many stayed at Camp Solidarity on Cecil the banks. Cecil Roberts called the strike unique. Strikers used nonviolent civil disobedience tactics from the civil rights era. The union was willing to commit all their funds to win this strike because they saw it as a class struggle, affecting every working man and woman. Civil rights activist Jesse Jackson rallied mine workers on two occasions. Dole and former Secretary of Labor William Usury's diplomacy brought an end to the debate on January 1, 1990. Usury's diplomacy helped the two sides come together, and after four months of debating, they brought an end to the strike. A contract was signed February 20, 1990. In the years following the strike, the Union's essence has remained strong. There is deep-seated loyalty in generational miners, but the Union's numbers are diminished. Only one Union mine operates in the area today. The UMWA has found success in areas having a more diverse workforce. The union was successful in restoring health care to retired miners and their dependents. The United States Supreme Court overturned the fines against the mine workers. As a consequence of the strike and subsequent debate and diplomacy in the U.S. Congress, the greater debate over company responsibility for health care was settled with the passage of the Coal Act. The outcome was a success for local strike coordinator Jackie Stump, who won a seat in the Virginia House of Delegates in a write-in campaign. Pittston was bought by Alpha Natural Resources in December 2002. With the purchase of Massey Energy in 2011, Alpha became the world's foremost producer of metallurgical and coal for electrical power production. Was there anything good that came out of it? I think probably uh, the one thing in my mind that, that came out good out of it was the realization that neither side wanted to ever go through something like that again. I think that uh, hopefully that that lesson was learned. Um, that's what sticks in my mind. Uh, we've never uh, done that here in this area again since then. And I hope that both sides realize that uh, there's ways to settle differences without going to those kind of things. Hit 
the coal miner boogie. Hit the coal miner boogie and you boogie boogie all night long.